As I said this morning, you're all the ones that took my grandbabies away from me. <laughs> my little Hensley, my little Hollis, my little Heston. And uh, now we've got another one coming. And do you realize how far it is from Tulsa, Oklahoma to, to Graham, North Carolina? It's 19 stinking hours. And it uh, costs a whole lot of money to get over here by plane. My wife and I, when we first found out that they were coming over here, I have to admit, we shed a few tears as grandparents. We love our grandbabies a lot. Yeah. And uh, one day I was home, I was in the office, well, I was actually in the office, and uh, talking to a buddy of mine, and uh, his son and, and daughter-in-law took their kids to Lebanon. And they were talking about how they missed their grandbabies. And I went home, and I told my wife, I said, at least we don't have an ocean between ours. <laughs> so, uh, so it was just, uh, it's, I uh, thought I enjoyed being a father, but I really enjoyed being a grandfather. And um, grandparents have as much of a responsibility to make sure that we pass our faith on to our grandchildren as much as we have a responsibility to pass our faith on to our children. Can I have an amen? And how many of you got grandchildren? Let me see your hand. How many of you, if you could trade it out, you'd bypass the kids and just go strictly to the grandkids? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a long time ago. First Peter chapter five, if you will. Thank God for his word. You understand that when you read this word right here and you crack it open, you're reading life as it best, at its, at its best. It doesn't, get any, it doesn't get any wiser than this right here. Doesn't get any clearer than this right here. Doesn't get any better than this right here. This, this word that we hold in our love is a precious treasure that God's given to us along with his spirit to help us until we see him face to face. Amen? Amen. Never forget, I was ministering in Kalamazoo, Michigan for a friend of mine. And uh, after we had gotten out of service, we went to lunch. And uh, the pastor's wife, while we were talking, took out a napkin and she put a bunch of dots all over the napkin and, uh, and then pushed the napkin in front of me. And she said, connect the dots. And I said, well, you know, I looked at it and I thought, well, and I said, I can't connect the dots. She said, why? I said, well, there's no numbers by the dots. And she said to me, she said, you know, Doug, she said, that's, that's what happens to a lot of us in church services. We hear this message, we hear that message, we hear this doctrine, we hear this subject ministered on, we get this topic delivered to us, and then we just kind of shove it out in front of you all and just say, well, connect the dots. In other words, make this, dot connect, make this sermon series connected to the last sermon series, and make this subject connected to the... And, and, and I found that as a whole, it's not your responsibility to connect the dots, to figure out how this topic connects to that topic. It's my job as a minister to make sure that I connect the dots for you. And so, 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 so we can make sure that the topics that we're ministering on relate to other topics and subjects and, 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 and issues. And so for me, you know, after teaching at Raymond now, I've been with Brother Hagen for 45 years. And uh, I've taught at the school at Raymond Bible College that Anna went to. Uh, I've taught over there for 37 years. And um, ministering to the different students over the years, I found this to be true, that the foundation of their life that's been laid within them um, by pastors, by ministers, is vital. Uh, an individual's foundation determines the quality and the quantity of their life as they proceed. Uh, Paul said these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. He said, for I laid the foundation, so you be careful how you build upon it. Paul was a foundation man. He believed that the foundation of the Christian life was more important than the, um, I like to put it like this. Uh, how many of you understand this? Can I put it to you like this? Uh, how many of you know there's ABCs of Christianity, but there's also elemental Ps? You understand what I'm saying? And how many of you know the ABCs are more important than the element, uh, elemental Ps? Uh, how many of you know the, 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 the core of arithmetic uh, is more important than, than, than calculus? Uh, recognition of numbers, number order, 
than how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That's more important for you to know than the because these things, if they're unknown or they're, if they're confusing, then all of a sudden the calculus gets confused, the algebra gets confused, the geometry. And if you're kind of like me, how many of you out there are kind of like me? You never made it past decimals. Let me see your hands. <laughs> Fractions kind of freaked you out, you know, percentages just kind of warped your brain. And uh, I flunked algebra twice and just gave up on it, you know. I never could figure out how you can, how you can count with, with letters. I never could, give me the numbers. I don't want to, I don't want to A plus B equals Z. I, for, I want number, but anyway. And so the thing about it simply this is, is that there's foundational issues within every issue. In, in the issue of mathematics, like I said, number recognition is first and foremost. Without that, you're going to get messed up in, in all these other areas. And so the number recognition issue touches every other, other element of math. There is, there is a subject in the Bible, as you, as, you, as you review this Bible from afar, so many of us read our Bibles, we're in it verse by verse, and we're just down in the nitty gritty of it all. But sometimes you need to kind of take a bird's eye view of the Bible. Never forget, I grew up in Michigan, and so I was at University of Michigan at a football game, and uh, there were people all around me, all, all behind me, in front of me. I was kind of on the 50-yard line area, had great seats, and, um, and, and so we got home from the football game, and they were playing replays from uh, over the news, and they had showed, if you will, some uh, blimps view. And I thought to myself, wow, it looks a lot different from a blimps view than it was sitting in the sitting in the actual seats. A lot of times we get, we get caught up with the with, with this actual seat issue and not a bird's eye view. And if you read your Bible from a bird's eye view, you'll see that there's certain subjects that pop to the top. And one of those subjects that pop to the top significantly throughout the Word of God is mentioned here in 1 Peter chapter 5, and I want to begin reading with verse 5. I believe that the subject that I'm ministering to you on is the most important subject for us as Christians. And it's not about love. It's not about faith. It's not about the Holy Ghost. It's not about uh, tithes. It's not about giving. It's not about... Uh, this issue is more important than the issues that I've just mentioned. 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's go. In verse 5. Peter says these words, Likewise, ye younger... Submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another. Here it is. And be clothed, underline it, and be clothed with humility. And be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know, uh, I've always encouraged my students to, to, to learn every aspect of God. And in verse 5, he, he, he shows us an, an aspect of himself that is not mentioned much in the podiums today. But uh, this verse is written to believers. This is not written to the world. And he informs us that God can actually be found resisting you. And I got to thinking about that one day, and I thought to myself, you know, no, wait now. You know, I got the world resisting me. I got the devil resisting me. I got my flesh resisting me. I got the mind resisting me. How many of you know, guys, you don't need God on that team? I need him off that team. But, but he says in order to get God off that team, you're going to have to put on the clothes of humility. I believe that humility is the primary principle of a, of a life as a Christian. Without it, we're going to struggle. In every other area of our life, walking in love, we're going to struggle. Forgiving others, we're going to struggle. Parenting issues, employment issues. Uh, our mind issues, depression issues, we're going to struggle if we know nothing about putting on the clothes of humility. And so listen to what he says here is going to happen uh, as he encourages us to put on the clothes of humility. Look at what it says here, verse 5. Uh, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is the roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. The first thing that I want you to see from these verses in 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 is this. Is these verses are not written to unbelievers. These verses are written to believers. But they're written to believers who have put on the clothes of humility. 
Because you can be a believer that, 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 is, that has failed to take upon himself that responsibility. This, these verses are written to the person who puts on the clothes of humility. He says these words in verse, in verse um, 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. You who? You who have put on the clothes of humility in due time. Casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. You who? You who have put on the clothes of humility. What's he doing to the other believers who's living in pride? He's resisting them. And then he says these words, you be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, whose adversary? The people that are humble. How many of you know, if you're living in pride, which is the opposite of humility, the devil's already got you. And so he, he, you're not a concern for him whatsoever. And so the thing about it is, 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 is now, now he's the adversary of the believers who are humble. They put on these clothes. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Who's he talking about there? Talking about people who are humble. Resist him. Now, I want you to notice here in verses 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, I see four blessings that will come to us when we put on the clothes of humility. Here we go, guys. Number one, verse 5. And be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, underline it, and giveth grace to the humble. The first blessing that God will give you when you put on the clothes of humility is that God will give you more grace. And I'm sure Pastor Josh has talked about this. Grace means enablements, empowerments. God will empower you to be a, a, a proper spouse. He'll empower you to be a proper parent. He'll empower you to be a blessing on the job as an employee. He'll empower you in your mind. He will, the moment you put on the clothes of humility, God gives you more grace in that area that you have clothed yourself with humility with. So he gives us more grace. It's a blessing that comes to us. And I'm just going to say this. You don't have to use your faith to get this grace. The moment you put in the clothes of humility, God promises you, I will give you more grace. You don't have to use your faith to believe you receive it. You've already got it. In fact, it's kind of like this. I use this as an illustration a lot. You know, that hurt. I didn't have to believe for the pain. I didn't have to use my faith to, you know, to get the pain. The pain was the automatic result of the hit. The moment you put on the clothes of humility, he automatically gives you more grace in that area. And you'll understand that phrase in a little bit. And then he says these words. Verse 6 is the second blessing that will come to you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, underline it, that he may exalt you in due time. Oh, this is a blessed verse. The word exalt means this, guys. It means to raise up, to be lifted up. There are parents that need to be lifted up and out of their teenage problems with their teenagers. The only way that God can lift them up and out of those problems is if you'll put on the clothes of humility. There are spouses that need to be lifted up and out of marital struggles. But the only way that you can be lifted up and out of those marital struggles is when you put on the clothes of humility. Some of us need to be lifted up and out of some employment problems concerning our future. The only way that that can happen is, is when we put on the clothes of humility. He said that when you put on the clothes of humility, I will give you more grace and I will exalt you in due time. I will lift you up and I will raise you up. Glory to God. Then notice what it says here, verse 7, is the third blessings that will come to us who put on the clothes of humility. And that is this, casting all of your care upon him, underline it, for he careth for you. If you've ever experienced the touch of God's care, it's the, most, it's the most incredible thing you'll ever experience. But it only comes as we put on the clothes of humility. The, the fourth thing that I see is found in verses 8 and 9. You be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. In other words, what he's simply saying is this. When you put on the clothes of humility, you're not going to have any trouble at all resisting the devil. You're not going to have any trouble at all resisting him. He'll give you more grace. You'll be exalted in due time. You'll experience a touch of his care. You're going to have no trouble at all resisting the devil. These blessings will come. But here again, if you're a believer and you've not put on the clothes of humility, then you're not going to be given more grace. You're not going to experience a touch of God's care. These things come to people who have put on the clothes of humility. And listen to me now. And you can't override the disobedience our disobedience of putting on the clothes of humility, you can't override that with a faith confession. You're going to have to go ahead and put on the clothes of humility. And so with all that in mind, 
he says that we are to put on, it's a responsibility given to each and every one of us, that we are to put on these clothes. So that, with that in mind, if, if you know you're humble, now people that sat through my first service, you, 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 you stay silent in this area, but if you know you're humble, I want you to stand up. It's interesting that I've never had a congregation anywhere in the, anywhere in the country ever stand up with this issue. When it comes to asking them if they're humble, then I want you to stand up. Because what's happened is this, guys, too much of the world has gotten into the church. How many of you know God said that my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts? And so, and so anytime that the world's definition of godly issues uh, matches the church's definition of godly issues, the church is always wrong. Because the world cannot know God's way. They don't know God. They don't know his ways. So when we embrace their ideas about a biblical subject, uh, um, uh, then, then we can pretty well guarantee that we're wrong. Because our minds are to be renewed by the word of God, changed by, we are to think differently, we are to talk differently, we are to act differently than, the, than what the world thinks, talks, and acts. And so the world has taught us, if you ever say you're humble, you're not. Because if you ever say you're humble, you're really in pride. Now, I want you to think about this, how stupid this whole th logic is. What would happen if I went into my closet this morning and put this shirt on, and I came to church, but I could never tell you that I got this shirt on, because if I tell you that I got this shirt on, then I really don't have this shirt on. <laughs> don't make me tell you that again. That's, that's a tough one. I have to think about that one when I, when, I, when I use that illustration. That's what the world said. If you put humility on, you can't ever say you got it on because if you say you got it on, you don't really have it on. That's not true. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, Anna and Josh would know this individual, uh, by a man by the name of Dr. Ken Stewart. Uh, he was a dean of the school at the time. And uh, I, I had begun to study this issue of humility and had come to this point to where it is okay to say that you're humble. And, uh, and so I, I went to him about this issue and, and said to him, I said, I said, Dr. Stewart, I said, you know, what, what about this? He said, have you ever read Numbers, and I, I'd have to go find the verse, where the Bible says that Moses was the humblest man in the book of Numbers. He was the humblest man upon the face of this earth. I said, well, yeah, I, I remember that. He said, who wrote the book of Numbers? <laughs> he, I said, Moses, Moses did. I said, <coughs> he said, Moses is the one saying that of himself. The moment you understand what humility is, the moment you understand, then you can be aware of whether you got it on or whether you got it on. We are to put on the clothes of humility. So what is humility? What's the definition of humility? I've taught my students for years that when it comes to any subject, you have to teach three things. What it is, how it comes, what do you do with it once you got it? If you can't define it, you can't show people how to get it, can't show people what to do with it once you got it, you got a problem. So let's define what this humility that we've been commissioned by Peter to put on, let's find out what it is. J James, if you will, chapter 4. James chapter 4. Y'all doing okay this morning? Yeah. James chapter 4. James 4. Going a little bit slower than we did today, and I appreciate that. You can dig in a little bit, little bit deeper. James chapter 4. And I want to begin, if you will, in verse 6. Because it took me quite some time to find this, this, this passage, but it defines what humility is. Listen to what James says. It sounds a whole lot like 1 Peter chapter 5 in what Peter said to us. James chapter 4, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. That sounds just like what 1 Peter 5 said. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In verse 7, you see the word therefore. Now, we were taught that the word therefore connects what's being said to what's been said. So I like to read verses 6 and 7 like this. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Since he's given grace to the humble, then be quick about it and submit yourself therefore to God. I present this for your consideration. The definition of humility is submission to God. When you submit yourself to God, you are humble. That tells me then that, that when you do not submit yourself to God and his instructions, then you're in pride. 
Because humility is submission to God. Pride is failure to submit yourself to the instructions or to the command. And so, you know, and I thought about that once I saw that. Well, you and I both know that there's been a lot of teaching about the word submission. It's generally spoken of in the issue of the marriage covenant. Uh, wives, submit yourself. And so a lot of, a lot's been done with that word. But I looked up the word submit, and the word submit means this. It means to retire, to withdraw, hence to yield. It means to retire, to withdraw, hence to yield. Okay, don't like that? It means this. Watch this, guys. It means to retire from your way, to withdraw from your way, and yield to God's way. What is humility? Humility is retiring from my way, withdrawing from my way, and yielding to God's way. I call this the humility three-step. Now, I grew up with some of God, and, and we were never allowed to dance. Never once. Never allowed to dance. But this is the dance the Lord taught me. And this dance, listen to me now, is what got me into the kingdom of God. I, I came to a place as, as a young teenager where I retired from my way and I withdrew from my way and I confessed with my mouth and I believed in my heart that God was raised from the dead and I yielded to God's way and I was saved. And the moment that I was saved, he lifted me like he told me he would, he would exalt me. He exalted me out of the kingdom of darkness and threw me into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm now a child of God, seated with him in heavenly places. But I never would have, never would have been exalted to the place of, of a child of God until I first helped me retire, withdraw, and yield. Say it with me one more time. To what? Retire, to withdraw, and yield. What, what is humility? It means to what? If humility is retiring from our way and withdrawing from our way and yielding to God's way, then pride is this. Now, as I was sitting there, getting ready for the service, as, as you all were singing, the Lord reminded me of, of an illustration. Go back with me, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 5. A couple of pages. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. He said these words, And be clothed with humility. Watch this now. For God resists the, but he gives grace to the. You all okay with that? Yeah. Now think about this. As parents, how many of us have ever given an instruction to one of our children and our children did this? Yes. Now, now when they did this, <laughs> uh, is, is this, is this the same, this, as this? Because when your child with, retires from their way, withdraws from their way, and yields to your way, yeah. is it not true this becomes open to them? <laughs> <laughs> but when you give an instruction to a child and they do this, right. yeah. every child wants access to this right here. <laughs> Isn't that right? And when they, and they ask, in the midst of their this, they ask for ice cream. Are they going to get ice cream? No. no. Who gets the ice cream? The one who what? Oh, honey, what do you want? Now, isn't it true that you're resisting the, the one that's living in pride? You're resisting the prideful. Is that not right? That means you still let them live. You still allow them to pillow that you bought and the electricity that you bought and the water that you bought the toilet paper that you bought you still let them use those things but the benefits the blessings the extracurricular come on brother Hagin used to teach this all the time spiritual things are a lot like natural things a lot of things coincide with one another. When parents find a child doing this, man, they pull back. They still, they're still in the family. Yeah. Right. 
Come on. Yeah, right. Y'all out there? Yeah, that's right. But that parent is waiting for one, 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 one turn in their hearts to where they help me, they what? Retire. Retire. Now, once I saw that this was the definition, do you now understand this? Why I said that humility is the primary principle that touches every part of Christianity. How many of you understand this? You're not going to be found walking in love until you first put on the clothes of humility toward that person. Because love does what is the most beneficial for the recipient at the moment. Come on, guys. Love joyfully chooses to take an action that promotes the welfare of another. You're not going to be found walking in love toward your fellow man until you first put on, because there's going to be a lot of individuals that don't deserve to be loved, that don't earn to be loved, but we're to love unconditional. And the only way for us to love unconditional is for you and I to put on the, the clothes of what? Humility. Humility. The issue of forgiveness. There's a lot of individuals. This, this verse was reminding me as I sat there. Uh, go with me if you go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Very familiar passage. It says these words. Philippians 4. Verses 6, 7, and 8. Listen to what it says here. He says, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. But in everything that you're worried about and concerned about, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Did you know that there's a lot of individuals today that have issues that they're worried about, that they're concerned about, that they've never prayed about one bit? Good. Yeah. Do you understand this, and I know that you do, um, that a lot of our prayer is to be intimate with our Heavenly Father. Every one of us has a friend maybe a spouse, that we're to be intimate with. What do we do? We bear it, we bear it all. We tell them every nitty-gritty of the situation. We tell them our hurts. We tell them our... How many of you know we're to be that way with our Heavenly Father? And he says, when you have something that's worried you, concerns you. I was doing a marriage conference a while back ago, and and um, pretty good crowd. And so I asked them, what are, your, what are your main concerns in life at this stage of your life? And every one of them but two either said they're adult children or they're grandbabies. And I walked away from that thinking to myself, you know, I, 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 I understand that. How many of you know with every new season of life there are new seasons of, and new areas of, to be concerned about with every new, with every new season. Yeah. But the things that concern us, the Bible says that we're to actually bring to them to the Lord in prayer. And he says, when you do, if you'll do, if you'll just yield to him and bring those things to him in prayer, look at verse 7, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. How many of you understand this? You'll never get verse 7 if you don't do verse 6. Do you see that? So many individuals are trying to bypass the, the intimate prayer life with God and use their faith to get peace. Or, you know, I've seen it happen. I'm sure pastors see, have, actually have hands laid on people to get more peace. Really? You're going to lay hands on people to get peace in them? Peace comes when you bring what you're concerned about to the Lord in prayer. Right. It's amazing how that when you take a spiritual action, God pours out his peace in that. How many of you have ever been in a tough situation within a hospital? Difficult situation. There's no peace in the room whatsoever. Then all of a sudden somebody comes in the room and prays. And the moment they pray, the peace of God just floods that room. Right. Ever had that happen? Why did that happen? Because you obeyed, you yielded to, you put on the clothes of humility to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. But notice what it says here in verse 8. He says, Finally, my brethren, what sort of things are true and lovely and just and pure, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I like to put it like this. If you want verse 7, you got to do verse 6. But if you want verse 7 to be continually active in your life, you're going to have to do verse 8. Think on these things. What's well, so these are true and lovely and just and pure. So many individuals, they, they put on the clothes of humility about what they're concerned about and pray. Peace comes into their life. 
But then all of a sudden they let their minds go on things that they should not be gone, allowed to be drifting over into. And all of a sudden the peace begins to leave their life. And they begin to think, well, what happened? God gave me peace originally in this situation. Now I don't have any peace at all because you didn't maintain your thought life. Yeah. You put on the clothes of humility in one area, but you didn't put on the clothes of humility in another area. You didn't guard your thought life. You didn't cast down those, those thoughts that should have been cast down. You all doing okay? So, so the issue is this, what is humility? Humility is to retire from my way, to withdraw from my way, and yield to God's way. Now do you understand this? The issue of pride and humility is not all or nothing. You will never be all humility, and neither will you be all pride, uh, because uh, prideful. Every one of us in this room has areas where we're humble in, and every one of us in this room has areas where we are in pride about. We've submitted to God's ways, and yet there's other areas in our life where we're not submitted to God's ways. It's not going to be all or nothing. And ne never in any part of our lives, no matter how gray I get, it's not going to be all humility. There's always going to be this area that I need to monitor in my life. Because once I enter into humility in one area, if I'm not real careful, I'll drift away. That's the reason why we need to stay in church. Because church reminds us of areas that sometimes we let get away from us. Th that we drift away from. Isn't that right? And so the thing about it is, is we need to maintain, we need to maintain ourselves. But the thing about it is, is this issue of humility and pride is going to be an issue we're going to be doing. Now, now can I say this? And I was reminded of this as, as you all were singing. Um, can I put it to you like this, guys? The whole humility three-step is what got you in the kingdom. You confessed with your mouth and you believed in your heart. You were saved. Can I put it to you this way? The dance that got you in the kingdom is the dance that you must maintain after you get in the kingdom. You can't switch dances. You can't come in the kingdom doing a retire from and withdraw from my way and yield to God's way. And then do this after I'm in the king. Come on, guys. Right. We're going to have to maintain the dance. Right. Now, is this the proper definition of humility? Is this what humility is all about? Go with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. Y'all doing okay this morning? How many of you have identified some areas in your life, maybe toward your employer, that, uh, that maybe you need to kind of brush up on a little bit? Amen? Put on the clothes of humility. Y'all out there? Yeah. This illustration was given to me by the Lord to help me to drive home the point that humility is retiring from our way, withdrawing from our way, and yielding to God's way. Is, am I sure that that's the proper definition? Chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him. How many of you know... Uh, there are some questions that Jesus received that are just stupid. Just didn't, I mean, just, I mean, should not even be, uh, you know, thought about it. Just, just get out of here. But notice he did not do that with, with the disciples about this question. That means this was a legitimate question. It has a legitimate answer. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus went out into the crowd and called a little child unto him, set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you that except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 4. What Jesus did was this, guys. Jesus used a child, and he used the word humility, to define the pathway, to show the pathway to greatness to adults. If you want to be great... You know, I've thought about this a lot. I've talked to my students about it a lot. 65 years old now. If there's anything that I want more than anything, when it's all said and done, as they walk past my casket, my wife hates it when I use this illustration, so I don't use it usually when she's in the house. You walk past my casket, I want nothing more but for her to say he was a great husband. The only way for that to be said about me it's for me to put on the clothes of humility while I'm leaving with her. 
submitting to God's ways. Reading in the Bible to find out what would God have me to do. You know, I've noticed in marriage counseling, done a lot of it, and um, I never had anyone ever ask me, what can I do to bring health back into my marriage? It's all about what she can do or what he needs to do. The whole issue is this, is you can't change her, he can't change, and you can't change him. It's going to be individual responsibilities embraced. Getting in the word of God and making sure that I'm, that I'm embracing my responsibilities. The Bible has much to say about husbands. And I am, to, I am to embrace that into my own life. But the Bible also has some things to say about parents. I want my children to say that I was a great father. I want my son-in-law and my daughter-in-law to say that I was a great father-in-law. I want my grandbabies to say that I was a great, a great grandfather, not just because of my age, but because of the, the touch of humility upon my life within that relationship. I want to be called a great employee. I want to be called a great department head. But that will only happen as I put on the clothes. Find out every, every area in life that you function in, every area that you, that you walk in. Get in the Bible and find out what the Bible says about that area for your life. And ask yourself the question, have I, have I, have I retired from my way about this issue? Have I withdrawn from my way about, have I yielded to God's instructions about how I am to conduct myself within that? Can I have an amen? So Jesus took a child, put him in the midst of them, walked out in the crowd. Found a child. Son, because what's your what's your name? Keegan. Keegan? Would you come here, Keegan? Everybody say hi to Keegan. How old are you, buddy? Eight years old. Good, good, good. Are you married? Okay, all right, all right. Sit down up here, Keegan. Jesus called a little child, set him in the midst of them, and said these words. How old are you, buddy? Eight. I believe Jesus could have picked an eight-year-old, six-year-old, maybe a seven-year-old, but a child. Set him in the midst of them, just like Keegan's sitting here, right here before all of us. All the adults looking at him. Turned around to the disciples and said these words. Verily I say unto you that except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child... The same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now my question is this. How many of you know Keegan? Let me see your hand. Parents? Anybody else know Keegan? <laughs> Keegan, you got some PR work to be doing, buddy. <laughs> Never once have I ever been in a church service where everybody in the church service knew who this child was. There's always there's been a handful. That tells me this that I don't believe that the child that Jesus chose that sat in the midst of them, that everybody in the crowd knew. That tells me this, that the lesson that Jesus wanted to teach the disciples about humility had nothing to do with the child's home life. Because how the child lives in his own home, you don't know. You don't know the child. You, don't know, you don't know, probably don't know the parents. You probably don't know how the child lives in the home. And so that lesson wouldn't, wouldn't resonate with you because you just can't make that connection. So that tells me this then, that the lesson learned about humility is within the sphere of the request and the response. Right. What do I mean by that? I went into the crowd and I'm looking for a child. I went back there and said, Little, what's, your, what's your name? Keegan. Would you come? He lay, you know what he really did? I'm going to tell you what he really did. Can I tell what you really did? Are you Okay. <laughs> He got his brother off of his, his brother was sleeping on his lap. That's okay, that's all right. I sleep through me too. And so, so think about this. And so, so he, he got the brother to get off his lap, you know, and he, he stepped out and came down here. Is it not true that what he really did was retired from his way, withdrew from his way, and yielded to my request? 
Is that not true? Is that not right? And isn't it true that the life of a child brought up properly multitude experiences within their life of having to lay down their way, retire from their way. Come on, guys. How many times our kids did not want to go to the grocery store to to go? I can't tell you, but they went anyway. Because that lesson had to be learned as an adult that I'm sorry, you can't do life your way. Even with Jesus, Jesus said these words, if you'll follow me. That tells me this way, you ain't leading. None of us are smart enough to lead our own lives. Your life is best lived as a follower, not a leader. Your life is best lived as a follower, not a leader. And a follower always has to, we had a department head meeting uh, Thursday. It was supposed to be one hour. I'm on vacation with my babies, but I went into the department because I'm a department head. You know, that thing went on for three hours. And there were things in there that I had to, because I did not get where I'm at as a ministerial overseer And I have not gotten where I'm at as an instructor of Rainbow Bible Training College for over 30 years by doing it my way. I work for them. Do I always agree? No. Do I always think, you know, wow, no. Lessons learned. And didn't the Bible say that that, uh, if you humble yourself in the sight of God, that he'll exalt you? He'll bless you? Isn't that right? Would 10 bucks be okay? You can go ahead and go back to your seat. Thanks, buddy. I did that one time. Didn't know I was headed that direction, but the Lord changed me right before I got up. And the only thing I had was a 50. <laughs> I learned a long time ago that when I, when I get anywhere near, you know, thinking that he may send me this way, I go out and get a 10s or 20s, you know, and <laughs> make sure that don't ever happen again, you know. <laughs> I've actually had children, when I ask them, would you come, hunker into their shoulder of their mom. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. And I go out and find another child in the crowd. They come up. I've actually had it happen to me twice over the last 10, 12 years where that child that said no, as I'm shaking hands with people as they come out the door, actually walk up to me and say, can I have $10 too? (laughs) And I don't say anything to them about it at all because you can't explain these kind of things to a eight-year-old, seven-year-old, five-year-old. But I looked those parents straight in the eyes because the lesson should be learned. That child was just that close right there to a 20 or a $10 bill. But because he chose to do and not. Listen, guys, your marriage and the health of your marriage is that close away. That's good. That's right. All it takes is a little bit of... That's good. Come on, guys. I'm going to do it God's way. A lot of us are this close to a promotion on the job and favor on the job. Doing things out your way. Can't do things your way. Can't do things your way. You're going to have to yield to God's way. You're going to have to yield to God's way. It's what got you this far in the kingdom of God. It's what will get you as you progress.